All right. Well, welcome everyone to the Region 1 Planning and Policy Council meeting, the last one of 2021, if you can believe it. Uh, my name's Kirby Fye. I'm with the department. Uh, just a few things to go over before we get started. Um, you'll notice I have everyone muted. I had a lot of feedback coming through when I first joined the call. So um, if you uh, have any questions, need to um, speak up or comment on anything, if you've joined via MS Teams, just unmute your microphone. And if you've joined via your phone, you'll just have to hit star six. Um, so I just wanted to let you all know the process for that. Um, this meeting is being held virtually uh, per the Open Meetings Act. Uh, the Region 1 Council, um, along with the other six regional planning and policy councils, opted to continue to meet virtually this quarter just to keep everyone safe during the pandemic. Um, and we'll reassess how we'll meet um, for the next quarterly meeting uh, when that time comes. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, go through attendance. I'm first going to uh, go through the attendees that have joined the MS teams because I can see your name. Um, and then I'll go through the individuals who have called in. So remember um, when I when I take the attendance for individuals who have called in to state your name, you'll have to hit star six. So like I said, my name is Kirby Fye. I'm with the department. Uh, we have Jeannie Price, Melissa Birdwell, Amy Little, Avis Easley, also with the department, Becky Allen, Christy Blaylock, Joey Smith, Caitlin Sturgill, Kendra uh, Quillen, Christy Tipton, Kurt Hippel with the department, Melanie Ison, Samantha Slagle, our vice chair, Tim Perry, our chair, Wendy Ramsey. Uh, hold on, my uh, Lisa Lapolt. She just joined the call. And then um, it looks like we have a few individuals who have called in. If your phone ends in 2190, can you please state your name? You'll have to hit star six. <clears throat> that might be me because I'm calling from my school phone, but it doesn't actually have my direct number. So this is Kayla Withrow. If that's me, might just yes. be science whole center in general. It is. Hi, Kayla. Um, if you if you're uh, the last four digits of your phone number are zero four eight four, can you please state your name? Emma. Pardon? Jim Broheimer. Hi, Jim. If the Hi. last four digits are 6,000, can you please state your name? Vonda Wagner. Hi, Vonda. And last but not Hi. least, if your last four digits are 3074, can you please state your name? Oh, sorry, Casey Caudell. Hi, Casey. All right, um, I'll hand it over to you, Tim. Thank you, Kirby. And thank you again for everyone that's joining our meeting for Region 1 Planning Policy Council. We again appreciate you being part of this and thank you for your attendance and being part of our council. We will begin our agenda following our agenda. You should have a copy of the agenda with some other documentation that was sent out earlier about uh, today's meeting. Uh, they included, and that was in the invite from Kirby, including that is the agenda, as well as some other documentation, including last minutes, of the last meeting. So hopefully you've had a chance to look over those. If not, if you get a chance to look over those, if you would please, then I'm going to open the floor up once you have had a chance to read the minutes for an approval of the minutes of the previous meeting. And if you're voting to approve, please just state your name and that you make a motion to approve. Sam Slagle, motion to approve. Thank you, Sam. Do I hear a second to approve the minutes? This is 
Becky Allen and I second the motion to approve the minutes. Thank you, Becky. Any question, comments, correction, or addition to the minutes? If not, then we will let the minutes stand as approved and printed. Thank you. Old business. A couple things on our old business reminder is, of course, that we are still continuing our member enrollment and application process. Kayla Withrow, our secretary, would be glad to assist anyone in making sure that you get an application and that you're added to our email list. If you are not getting the emails from the department, usually those come from uh, either the department or from myself or Sherry Bradley with uh, one, please let us know. You can shoot me an email at T-P-E-R-R-Y at Frontier Health. It's all one word, frontierhealth.org. And we'll make sure that you get added to the email list. If you need an application or if you know someone that would want to be part of our council and would like to have an application to join, please let myself or Kayla Withrow know and we'll make sure that you get an application so that you can become a registered member of our council. The only other business, old business, of course, is over workforce shortage issues, uh, which continue to be a significant concern in our area. Uh, we actually met, the legislative committee met just before this meeting, and we'll have some a report out about that meeting a little bit later. Uh, and the workforce shortage was the primary topic of that meeting. Uh, it is still something on our needs, uh, concerned for us to be uh, mindful of and our needs, uh, uh, concerns for this region, uh, work in healthcare, including behavioral health, the workforce shortage is still a major critical area of concern for us. And we wanna keep that at the forefront as we think of needs assessments going forward. Any other old business that anyone has? Any other old business? If not, then we will move on to new business. Again, just a reminder, please keep your mics on mute and as well as your phone, please, so we can avoid background noise. New business. Uh, first off, I'd like to welcome a couple of new members to our legislative committee. Our legislative committee in the past has not been as strong as what we would like for it to be, so we have revamped, reorganized, and really taking an initiative to have a stronger legislative subcommittee than one. And we've added new members to that committee now. So we are very grateful to have a, a strong working and effective legislative subcommittee for region one. Amy Little, Melanie Eisen, and Elisa Laplop are two are three of our newest members to our legislative committee. And the other members are myself as chair. Sam Slagle, uh, Melissa Birdwell, Kayla Withrow, and Vonda Wagner. So that makes up our legislative committee, and we had a very good meeting just before this one, uh, and we're looking forward to having a, more of these legislative subcommittee meetings in the future. So welcome new members to this committee. Uh, the next new business was about supporting uh, local legislative advocacy for behavioral health. We're going to talk more about that in, in the legislative committee um, um, report out when we get to that. But in addition to the minutes and the, and the uh, agenda, there's also a, a um, form or a document that had the names and email addresses for the legislators for Region 1. So you should have that in your packet. If you didn't get it, please let me know, and I'll make sure that you get a copy of that so that you know who our legislators are and how to reach them uh, through, through email, that is, anyway. So you will have that contact information. We do want that available to our members so that our members have their independent right in this council to reach out to our legislators, to, to uh, give them uh, acknowledgement of appreciation or to advocate for particular uh, legislation or statutes or bills that may be in the works or particular uh, proposals that may be on the table. So 
that have that information as well as uh, some of the uh, uh, talking points regarding the workforce shortage that came from the Tennessee Association of Mental Health Organizations and uh, how to address perhaps uh, why that is such an important issue for us in this state and in our region when addressing those concerns with legislators or others in the public arena. The last thing on new business is our uh, Region 1 accomplishments, challenges, and plans. And I would like to take just a few minutes to read over what was submitted for Region 1 as our accomplishments, as well as our challenges, and then our plans going forward. So this is for 2020, uh, 2020 and 2021 fiscal year. Our key accomplishments for Region 1. Region 1 began a campaign to update and enroll existing and new members in an effort to improve accuracy and update the membership roster. This effort is still underway. Region 1 was able to continue to hold meetings via WebEx teleconferencing due to COVID-19 outbreak, which continued to seriously affect members in the region. During this time, members were reached to establish new consumers and agencies in a means to help coordinate services and maintain stability of providing behavioral health and substance abuse services to individuals and families in our region. Resources and contact information for COVID-19 assistance is made available to all members. Using federal and state COVID assistance dollars, providers were able to help members access cell phones and other forms of technology in order for them to be able to receive services via telehealth means. Region 1 was able to support one another in helping connect members to needed services, areas of employment opportunities, communication with managed care representatives, and the availability of new funding opportunities of, at local, state, and federal levels. Region 1 members participated in a NAMI walk and in events with TSPN. Region 1 members participated in trainings provided by TCCY. Region 1 members participated in several community events, including Kid Power, community health fairs, and community job fairs throughout the year. Region 1 added new members to the CNY subcommittee, new vice chair of the adult subcommittee, and additional members to the legislative subcommittee. Region 1 had members, including the chair, attend a visit of, in our area of Governor Lee and First Lady to advocate for behavioral health needs in our area. Region 1 Council continues to stay in touch with local community, county, and city leadership about the importance of behavioral health services in our region and invite them to council meetings. Region 1 completed a needs assessment and again work on assessing the needs in our region for 2021-2022 year needs assessment, including new needs that may arise due to COVID-19. Region 1 has been reaching out to local universities in our region to inquire of them for membership to the council I have the school perspective for future council meetings. Challenges we faced. Of course, the biggest challenge this past year was the COVID-19 pandemic and the increase in behavioral health needs as a result of the pandemic, while simultaneously at the same time having a statewide workforce shortage in behavioral health professionals. The struggle was to maintain connectedness community members and help assist in community overcoming these challenges and continue to receive the supports and services they need. With the community mental health agencies able to reach people via telehealth means and the assistance of funds from state and federal government, the community was able to mobilize quickly so there was a minimum disruption in services for consumers. Resource information and flow of contact data for members was made possible to the community to stay informed of supports needed to help during the crisis. However, as the demand for behavioral health services increased over the course of the year, it strained the already stressed infrastructure for behavioral health providers who were struggling to maintain the staff to meet the higher demand for needed services. Schools reopened with children who were suffering from trauma of this past pandemic year and being academically behind. Therefore, the need for school services also increased dramatically. Nearly every agency that participates in Region 1 Council was faced with workforce challenges while trying to meet the growing need for services. The area was facing a housing shortage and economic challenges as a result of the pandemic as well. Therefore, consumer and behavioral health services were significantly affected. 
the homeless population grew, as did the need for more services to address housing and substance misuse problems. Plans, Region 1 will continue to work toward building its membership in the area. We will be planning to resume face-to-face -face meetings once we feel the environment is safe for the possible uh, from the possible spread of COVID-19 pandemic or, del or other variances. We plan to build our legislative subcommittee stronger this coming year by adding new members. We will continue to offer virtual meetings when appropriate and allowable for the safety and health of our members during this continued pandemic. We plan to start working on the needs assessment for 2022 fiscal year in the next few months. And we plan as a council to continue to support of the effort on the health sessions for behavioral health in our region and plan as a council to work with area agencies to advocate for ways to address the workforce shortage in community mental health. Questions, comments regarding our presentation for accomplishments, challenges, and plans. If not, then I believe we have a, uh, a program presentation on mental health housing that kind of follows suit with what we just talked about in our needs. Uh, and Sam or Joey, do you want to uh, take it over and, and give us a presentation on mental health housing? Kirby, can you play that video? I don't know how that'll transfer for the folks on the phone, but hopefully the sound might be enough. Sure, let me get it set up one second. And Joey, do you want to test your mic? Make sure you're live and in action. Can everybody hear me this morning? Yes, sir. yes we can. All right, fantastic. So Joey, do you want to introduce yourself and tell folks what they're going to be listening to in this video? I can. Good morning, everyone. My name is Joey Smith, and I am a residential manager at Grant Widener in Bristol um, in our mental health housing. I am also um, assisting our housing director, who you're going to hear in this video, to uh, go over some of the some of the ideas of our mental housing, how it works, and then we can talk a little bit about it after and answer any questions that we need to answer. Can everybody see my screen? Did it work? We can see it. Yes, ma'am. OK, I'm going to go ahead and press play. <laughs> We've got no volume, Kirby. I'm still not hearing anything. Is anybody else? I'm still not hearing anything. Yeah, nothing on my end either. I don't know what's going on. I can hear it fine on my end on my computers. Everybody's, I mean, obviously everybody's speakers are on because you can hear one another. I don't know uh, why it's not working. Hmm. I don't know. At the time that you shared your screen, did you indicate that it needed to have the audio turned on? Let me see. There, there is a little control button. I don't know exactly what it says, but there is a little control in that process. OK, so hold on. Let me check. Thank you. <laughs> hold on. <laughs> Latanya Colley, 
and I am the Director of Mental Health Housing here at Frontier Health in Northeast Tennessee. And on today, I would like to share with you all the things that we have going on in our housing continuum here at Frontier Health. Frontier Health serves the eight counties of Northeast Tennessee. That's the part of Tennessee that is east of Knoxville. Our housing continuum serves an estimated 111 people annually. We provide housing through several levels of care in our housing continuum. Gibson Place is our intensive supported living facility. It is two homes serving eight men and eight women. The homes share team members, resources, and a huge backyard. Gibson Place is our most intensive housing service. There is a dedicated case manager, nurse, and psychiatrist that serve the individuals in the home. We also have eight supportive living facilities. Our supportive living facilities are strategically located in our four largest catchment areas, Greenville, Kingsport, Johnson City, and Bristol. These homes focus on assisting individuals with a mental illness who can benefit from a structured environment while focused on learning and practicing activities of daily living to achieve improved in independence in the community. Another step in our housing continuum are our supported living apartments. These apartments offer the next step to full community integration while offering support and coaching surrounded independent living. Peer support specialists and case managers work together with the individuals to ensure housing stability. Our apartments are also strategically placed in our larger cities to promote access to resources and support. Although we do not operate Helix House, it is a Frontier Health property. We partnered with Oxford House to expand the Oxford House model in Johnson City, Tennessee. The Helix House has increased housing opportunities for 10 men focused on recovery from substance abuse issues. Frontier Health works closely with the Tennessee Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services to implement grants provided by the department. Several grants are available to assist with maintaining or acquiring housing. Examples of these grants include Intensive Target Transitional Supports, ITTS, Continuous Target Transitional Supports, CTTS, and Homeless Outreach. Frontier Health is always looking for opportunities to expand and increase housing opportunities for those in our communities with mental health and substance abuse issues. We work closely with our region's Creating Housing Initiative facilitators. In fact, we share offer space with them. Our mission at Frontier Health is to provide quality services that encourage people to achieve their full potential. Our housing continuum helps us to reach that mission. If you have questions or concerns about our housing opportunities, please contact LaTanya Colley at lcolley at frontierhealth.org. I think that video really touched well on our housing program with Frontier Health. It kind of showed you the different levels of housing that we have. Um, Housing's really close to my heart with this because we we want to make sure that everybody can learn to become independent with a little bit of structure, with a little bit of help, and with our housing program that helps us to do that. Uh, Gibson Place is a high needs home, is what extensive supportive housing means. Um, they have 24 hour awake staff there, so they they work more in shifts than the other supportive housings do the other eight. Um, you know, they have a staff of four at the supportive housings and they help cook for them, take them places, assist with their medications and just different things like that and give them opportunities to, to do things maybe they didn't get to do. And, you know, before they came to Frontier Health, we take trips, um, mm -hmm have parties just really have a good time and and i think that helps them to transition to some independence that they wouldn't have the opportunity to have if they wouldn't have come to us at frontier health um, talking about expanding the housing we definitely look at that because there's not enough uh, we definitely need more but our housing program has grown um, a lot over the last few years we have some fantastic staff members that work really hard to assist with that independence and to get them to be able to move forward and prosper and do things that they would like to do and need to do and still keep them going on the right track. Any questions on that video that I can answer that anybody may have?
okay, if you do guys do, I'll send my email out to you um, later on today when I get back into the office that we'll have. I'm assisting Tanya with everything. So feel free to call me if you have any questions and or if you have any suggestions that would to help us to expand or help us to grow the, the mental health housing in our area. It's really, really needed. And we really, really need more opportunities for folks in our area to to have somewhere to go to have that structured settle, setting. I think that's all I have, guys. Joey, thank you so much. Appreciate the presentation. Great presentation. Sam, thank you for helping us arrange that as well. Appreciate it. It's a good job. Good, good presentation. Uh, a very important topic. Certainly, housing is on our needs assessment. Typically, almost every year, it's on our needs assessment. So, good to have that information. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for having before, us. Thank you. Before we move on to our reports, uh, I would like to say that if you have a program or a presentation on a particular program from your agency or, or an organization that you would like us to include at one of our council meetings, please shoot myself or Sam Slagle an email. Just let us know about it and we'll try to incorporate that into one of our council meetings. We usually uh, have these in uh, somewhere 15 minute presentation, something like that, 30 minutes the most uh, for programs and things. So if you'd like to highlight a program or a particular service or particular something that's going on that you think would be beneficial for members of the council to know about, please let us know and we'll incorporate, try our best to incorporate that in one of our future council meetings. All right, and moving on through the agenda, we'll go on to hear out some of our reports and we'll start off with the uh, adult committee. Sam? Nothing to report. We're just uh, focusing on the needs assessment. So we need to all be thinking about what we want to work on um, in the, over the next few months so we can get a head start on that. Hi, uh, Tim. It's Kirby. Just, yes. um, I was going to say this as part of my de uh, part of my department update, but I feel like I should talk about it now, especially since we're about to do some committee reports. So the needs assessment, there's going to be um, a slight change to the needs assessment for 2022. I think it's a pretty good change, but I want to make you all aware of it uh, sooner than later. Um, so as some of you may, I don't know if all of you have participated in the uh, annual needs assessment, but every year, all seven of the regional planning and policy councils, along with the statewide children, statewide adults, and the consumer advisory board participate in an annual needs assessment in which they identify two mental health and two substance abuse needs specific to, to their region. Um, this information is supported by data that is then shared with me, I put together a needs assessment summary and share it with department staff and the commissioner, and they use that in developing um, the department's three-year plan, which, um, which highlights uh, programs and different action steps that the department is taking um, throughout the state, uh, as well as uh, there's a reporting piece at the end of it as well to show how much progress we're making and um, you know areas maybe that they, they need to adjust to make it more successful, things like that. Um, and they utilize the needs assessment summary when um, developing some of their programs. Obviously, not every need can be addressed, um, but it's something that they absolutely look at um, even when developing the budget. Um, I'm sure you all saw the budget hearing, or many of you have seen the budget hearing, um, and a lot of the things that were presented from Commissioner Williams are things that have been identified on the needs assessment for the past couple of years. Um, so with that being said, Every year, um, each of the councils and the statewide committees um, submit two mental health and two substance abuse needs. During our legislative proposal process um, in May, Region 2 had submitted um, a legislative proposal requesting to increase the number of needs that each region can submit um, annually. Commissioner Williams took a look at that. It's not something that needed to be um, 
addressed legislatively. Um, and she took a look at that. And what she has decided is that every region and uh, every everyone that participates in the needs assessment process has the option to submit anywhere from two to six needs. So um, the only requirement is that they have to um, equally represent mental health um, and substance abuse. So if you're going to submit two, one must be mental health, one must be substance abuse, four, same as it usually is, six, three mental health, three substance abuse. The data piece remains the same. Um, but yeah, so she wanted to give everyone the option to include more needs um, in their needs assessment that they're seeing in their region. So that is the biggest change um, for this for the 2022 needs assessment process. I just wanted you all to be aware of it. Thank you, Kirby, and that is excellent information. Uh, we have in the past, and I know almost all the um, times that I've been on these committees uh, struggled because we had more needs than we had uh, you know, opportunity to pick which ones we wanted to submit. So giving us the option of having more, I think is a, is a great idea and will be a, a a big benefit to the regional councils across the state. Thank you. Moving on with reports, uh, CNY subcommittee, Kayla. Hey, kind of a similar thing to Sam, nothing new that I'm aware of, but we are definitely getting ready for um, the needs assessment, and we invite anyone who's interested in being on the CNY subcommittee to discuss that, just to reach out to me or Melissa um, so we can get that set up as far as when our meetings are and when we're going to address those needs. Thank you, Kayla. Uh, next on the agenda is the legislative committee, and I, deal, I will report out on the legislative committee. We did meet prior to this meeting. It was a uh, the, the entire committee met. Great meeting, by the way. And what we did in that meeting was we looked at the budgetary proposals that had been made through the budget hearings, uh, the department's proposal, uh, which included a uh, 20% rate increase for state funded behavioral health services and a $10 million reoccurring dollars for workforce shortage issues in the way of sign on bonuses, paid internships, and scholarships, et cetera. Uh, and also TenCare, a proposal of $11 million increase in community mental health center rates for TenCare recipients and providers of TenCare services at the, at the um, with also the elimination, the elimination of duplicative services and also DCS and requesting a $27 million provider rate increase as well as an increase for DCS case managers uh, uh, rates as well. And what we decided as a council, we wanted to uh, wanted to as a or as a committee wanted to recommend for the council that we, as Region One, express our uh, appreciation and our support in these uh, budget proposals that now go to the uh, uh, to the legislators to review and then finally to the governor for approval. So we uh, we are very appreciative and very much support. Uh, the these funding requests. Some of these are are uh, probably the largest requests that I have seen in 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 many years, if not ever, in my my history with the uh, with the department with ten care working to see these increases. So uh, it's it's much needed, and it helps us address a a crisis in workforce issues with behavioral health services, uh, not only in our region but across the state. And it does, as Kirby has mentioned goes to the needs that were addressed uh, in Region 1 and elsewhere across the state toward workforce shortage issues, school-based service needs for mental health services, et cetera. So we do appreciate that and want to uh, express that uh, to the council from a subcommittee that we would like to encourage the council as a whole to say that we are in support of and appreciative of these, these budget requests that the department and TenCare and DCS have made regarding these increases. Also, we wanted to encourage uh, each individual member that uh, you have a copy or should have a copy of the, uh, if not, I can provide that to you, a copy of the names and contact information for the legislators of our region. 
that you can reach out to them independently and individually to express your appreciation for their for uh, continued services for behavioral health services and helping to address these workforce shortage issues and at your discretion advocate for them to review these these uh, proposals uh, with advocacy for uh, addressing the behavioral health and healthcare disparities and shortages across our state. So uh, we encourage that. There was one concern or a concern that came out of uh, the committee uh, regarding one of the, uh, as mentioned, part of the proposals, and that was a reduction in peer support centers. And Kirby, perhaps when you get to your department update, you or are, are, uh, Kurt can address that to some degree because there was some concerns uh, from the committee about, uh, about a reduction in peer support centers. And I want to let uh, uh, Kayla Withrow, she did a really good uh, spill to the committee about, uh, about uh, being a student as well as being your health provider and how important these dollars are to, to someone in, in, in roles such as she's in. So, Kayla, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, of course. Um, so this is coming as someone who just graduated from a social work master's program in the last two years and just the importance of those reimbursement rates because it's very expensive to go back to grad school and it's really difficult to recruit people to come in and be therapists when you look at the cost of grad school versus what you actually make as a therapist. So those reimbursement dollars are so important for recruitment. It is hard to recruit people knowing that it might not add up you know, long term as far as student loan repayment. And of course we have student loan forgiveness, but that takes quite a while for all of that to set in. Um, and then the other piece as far as helping with licensure, the licensure process is of course very long, a lot of stuff going on, um, and just potentially advocating for a portion of those licensure hours to be counted with non-direct clinical contact hours because a lot of therapists do collaborative work that's really important to the therapeutic process, but that doesn't get to count towards our clinical hours. So some advocacy to help speed up the licensure process while still being able to get in those hours, count those hours, um, and work towards getting LPC, MHSP, LCSW, all that higher licensure level. And that's it. Thank you, Kayla. I appreciate that. It was uh, coming from someone who just finished a school program and is in the behavioral health field. It kind of gives you a sense of a personal perspective of how important these funding, this funding is and this budget is and, and how much that, uh, that we want to say appreciation to the department and to uh, all departments for asking for these increases and how valuable and, and, and how much we feel it's going to benefit the, um, the workforce crisis issue that we're actually facing in our region. Any comment or question regarding this report out from the legislative committee? Okay, if not, we'll move on to other reports. Um, any MCOs on the call that would like to report? Any of our managed care organizations? If not, do we have any inpatient facilities? Crisis, CSU, we have someone from Crisis, CSU. Anyone from Youth Villages? NAMI. Have anyone from NAMI that wants to make a report on what's going on with NAMI in the area? Oh, hi. Sorry, this is Elisa Laporte with uh, NAMI Tennessee. And um, I am on the steering committee for NAMI Green County. We are looking for new members. We're trying to grow in the region. 
Also, we've got some um, increased focus on Johnson City. So if any of you all would like to get involved with helping grow our NAMI programs and NAMI presence in the area, please, please let me know. Be happy to help make that happen. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Community justice. TCCY. ADRC. <clears throat> Anyone with TSPN? Anyone with, with TMHCA? Disability rights. This is Becky Allen. I am here, but I don't have any specific report to share today. Thank you, Becky. Other providers or other organizations. Christy Tipton, I saw you were on the call. Do you oh, want to I report out anything from disaster? Strike force. Hi, this is Jim Broheimer. I'm the program manager for the new ACT team through Frontier Health. No specific reports, but we're open for business. Thank you, Jim. And um, if you all can hear me, I know I'm on my phone, so it's a little hard. Uh, my name is Casey Cottell again, and I am actually the new Northeast Regional Coordinator for the Mental Health Association of East Tennessee. Um, and I don't have much to report other than just the fact that we've seen our numbers in the Northeast region grow immensely this year. Um, I guess my, my biggest report that I can give is right in the year, I'm, I'm trying to think it was 2019, 2020, that school year, we saw um, about 4,000 youth in schools. Um, and we were able to provide our mental health 101 course um, to those students, about, like I said, 4,000 students in the Northeast region, which is, you know, again, the eight counties. Um, last year, despite COVID restrictions and cancellations, we only saw uh, about an, a decrease of about 800 students. So even though our overall numbers were cut in half, uh, the Northeast still had a, a pretty great need. We saw just over 3,200 students. Um, but this year alone, we are already in the Northeast. We've already seen 2,000 students this year, um, and it's only November. <laughs> and so I've been uh, sharing that just with, with different councils and meetings and groups um, to let folks know that, um, that we are still addressing, you know, mental health in schools with um, fifth through 12th grade students um, in the Northeast, um, that there is an immense need um, in, the, in the area. Um, and that we are working, <laughs> we are working to address that need um, and and get, I guess, get our program out to as many schools as we can. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And, and I don't, I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of the uh, of Kayla, but I think we'd be glad to have you a part of our CNY subcommittee. If you'd like to be part of that, Kayla would be glad to have you as a member. That would be wonderful. Yes, please. Um, and and uh, just tell me whose email I need to <laughs> to to send yeah. something out to to get on the mailing list, and I will do that for sure. Casey, Kayla, do you want to get her now? Yeah, Casey. This is the same Kayla who's been emailing you from Science Hill. Just email. You can even add it into the ones we've been talking about for the other stuff when we were meeting for TSPN stuff. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Great. Yep. Thank you no all. No problem. Great, glad to have you. Thank you. 
other providers or other agencies? Um, my name is Caitlin Sturgill. I am the Behavioral Health Outreach Specialist for the Behavioral Health Safety Net for Children program. Uh, I just wanted to hop on here and kind of give a little bit of information about the program for you all, just so that you can um, utilize that. Um, so the Safety Net program is a program for children from ages 3 to 17 who are Tennessee residents. Um, and this program is for children who do not have insurance or are underinsured so that they can get behavioral and mental health um, services. And so for un underinsured clients, that would mean that they have private insurance. Um, and so they're able to get those basic services. So assessments, evaluations, and therapy. Um, but with safety net, they're able to step in and help get those additional services that are needed for each individual child. So whether that's case management, so someone just to work with them on a couple of mental and behavioral health goals, um, medication management, and a few other services that we provide as well. Um, but I just had to stop in and kind of give that information. Some of the services that are provided with safety net. Um, just so that you guys can have an idea of what this program can provide for these children and these families are assessments and evaluations, individual group and family therapy, case management, family support services, medication management, pharmacy assistance and coordination, and we can also help with transportation for the child to these services. So um, it's just a really good service to have information about and to kind of know about. And I can give you all my email in case you have any questions later on that you can think of. Um, my email is K N S T U R. G I L L at frontierhealth.org. And I can also give you my work phone number and you can call or text me. That number is 423-361-7183. So if you'll need anything or think of any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you, Caitlin. And if you wouldn't mind, put, the, uh, put that contact information in the chat box for us. That way we'll be able to have that. Thank you. Other providers or organizations. All right, if there are none, then I'm going to Turn it over to Kirby for the department uh, report. Kirby. All right, hold on one second. Let me pull this up. <clears throat> okay, so a few updates, a lot of funding updates um, since we last met. Um, many of these were shared via email. Um, so they might be kind of redundant, but in the event you didn't get any of these emails, I figured I would add them to the updates um, so that you can all be aware of them. Year three FY 2022 of the three year plan is complete and it can be found on the department website. The August report of year two FY 21 three year plan is also complete. If you would like to take a look at that, um, please reach out to um, Tim or Sam or me, and we'll be happy to share that information with you. The FY22 mental health block grant application was submitted to SAMHSA on August 26th. The FY22 mental health block grant report is in progress. Councils will have an opportunity to review that document soon. Hold on, I see someone's trying to join the call. Let me let them in. All right. <clears throat> Um, the department is expanding On Track Tennessee, Tennessee's first episode psychosis initiative to three new counties. Funding for this expansion is coming from federal COVID-19 pandemic response grants. On Track Tennessee works with youth and young adults ages 15 to 30 who've experienced a first episode of psychosis. 
The comprehensive intervention model uses a team of mental health professionals and support services, focusing on helping people work toward recovery and meeting their personal goals. The new locations for On Track Tennessee are Montgomery County, served by Mental Health Cooperative, Anderson County, served by Ridgeview Behavioral Health, and Rutherford County, served by Volunteer Behavioral Health Care Services. The counties were selected for expansion based on department mobile crisis data, which demonstrated a significant number of face-to-face -face crisis assessments for ages 10 to 24 in those counties. The department is requesting uh, proposals from community mental health providers interested in providing intensive long-term supportive residential services in East Tennessee. The goal of the intensive long-term support program is to provide quality, safe, and affordable permanent supportive housing for individuals discharging from the state's regional mental health institutes who would otherwise not be able to successfully live in the community due to the lack of available housing with the capacity to meet their specific needs. For the purposes of this announcement of funding, the program um, intends to serve individuals discharging from Moccasin Bend Mental Health Institute. The deadline to apply is November 22nd. I've included a link um, in my update that was shared with Kayla. She'll put it in the minutes um, where you can access this information on our department website um, about the deadline and, and what's needed in the um, application. The department is seeking proposals from agencies and organizations throughout the state of Tennessee to develop new safe quality and affordable permanent housing options for individuals experiencing mental illness, substance use disorders, and or co-occurring disorders. An additional focus on this funding announcement is for individuals ready for discharge from regional mental health institutes, including those who are uninsured. The deadline to apply is also November 22nd, um, and I've included a link for more information. The department is requesting proposals from agencies and organizations throughout the state to develop safe, quality, and affordable permanent housing options, to provide ongoing operations for newly created housing options, and or to provide recovery support services to benefit residents of newly developed safe, quality, and affordable permanent housing, permanent housing for Tennesseans living with substance use disorder. The deadline to apply is also November 22nd. This is part of the Creating Homes Initiative 2.0. And uh, last but not least, the department is seeking proposals from local providers interested in implementing the Tennessee Resiliency Project Grant in targeted communities. The department will provide funding to the seven um, Planning and Policy Council regions of the state to cultivate partnerships, assess communities' needs, and provide community-based, family-driven, evidence-based services and supports that align with the three um, Tennessee Resiliency Project grant goals. So the three goals are the first one is to promote early childhood mental health. The second is to increase access to school based mental health services, and the third is to ensure enhanced coordination of crisis care. Um, so position behavioral health professionals in child serving environments, um, emergency departments, pediatric practices, youth detention centers, etc. To assist with screening, um, the coordination and provision of mental health crisis support, um, and follow-up services. The deadline to apply for this is November 15th. Um, again, I've also included a link to that. Um, I know you had a question earlier about um, the reduction for peer support services. Kurt, are you still on the line um, or you can discuss that? Hey, Kirby. Yeah, I'm here. What was... What was the question? Um, I think it was, so you know, in the commissioner's budget request, it said at the um, end of it, the reduction, which I wanna say that it's been on there the past at least three years. Um, it's yes. been on there for the past three years or so, uh, where, you know, I think it's, if, if they didn't approve, like this is a way we can take a reduction or, or in the peer support services area. Right. Right. Usually um, in the process of generating the proposed budget for the governor, the governor will ask all departments um, to submit um, proposed increases and then submit um, uh, a certain percentage reduction. Um, that usually is an across the board ask for, uh, the de uh, for every department. So we're not being singled out here. Um, and um, 
the philosophy behind um, um, putting the peer support centers in uh, the reduction um, category is not because we don't value the services that they um, provide. In fact, we really do value those to a great degree. They do really wonderful work. However, when it comes down to um, uh, putting um, direct services, um, um, uh, putting possibly putting them in the reduction pile versus something else, um, we are going to try to look toward other areas where we can make that proposal. And, and please keep in mind that um, uh, through, a, through a variety of different things, um, these these reduction proposals um, haven't been taken in in, in years past. Um, either the the um, the governor has said, you know what, I I don't want to go down that road, um, or the 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 forecast for um, revenue is is better than we um, than the 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 funding board thought it was going to be, and no reductions or at least reductions from our department weren't needed. Um, so keep in mind that even though that is a proposed reduction, um, it is something that the governor still has to uh, take into account. Um, he might decide against it. One of the uh, one of the functions uh, as uh, y'all have as advocates that are independent from the department is that y'all have the ability to let your mind be known about the increases as well as the reductions that the department proposed um, and um, let the governor and let the, the legislators know how you feel about those things. I know Tam Ho and Tadis uh, and other organizations, NAMI, uh, Mental Health um, uh, Consumers Association, uh, and I'm probably leaving out some really great organizations. They do a good job of, 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 uh, of uh, creating documents, white papers, um, that um, let, again, the governor and the legislature know how they feel about the proposed budget. Um, so even with all the great news about um, the increases that were asked for, um, um, there is a long road to go. And uh, Zach Blair, uh, who you have met, and Kristen Veloff, who you have met recently, um, are part of our great legislative team. And they'll be working closely with um, the governor and the legislators to um, make sure that whatever the governor decides to present in his proposed budget in, in February, um, uh, that we will be fighting for for those increases. Does that answer the question? Yes, it does, Kurt. I appreciate that because that was that came out of the legislative committee, just a concern over it. And I'm, I appreciate you letting us know how that process works. Yes, sir. No, no problem, Tim. Kirby, did you have anything else or? I do not. That concludes my report. All right, Avis, do you have anything from the department on your side? Hi, Tim. Hi, everyone. No, I don't. I think um, Kirby and, and Kurt have summed it up, so I don't have anything to add. Thank you. Appreciate Appreciate you all being part of the council meetings and always joining us to give the advocacy and the support. I will reiterate what the legislative committee, subcommittee suggested and what you heard from Kurt, and that is that you have contact information. If you don't, or for some reason you didn't get it, let me know. I'll provide that for you. Uh, that's got the name of every legislator and their contact information. To let them know, one, we appreciate their advocacy for behavioral health services and for the support in addressing the workforce shortage issues that we have in our area and across the state, with behavioral health services, and advocating in support of, of, uh, of the budgets as they have been uh, as has been proposed, as well as any concerns that you independently may have for any reduction of services or any other uh, concerns in the budgets that you've heard from the budget hearing. Any other reports or any other information before we entertain a, mo um, 
A motion to adjourn the meeting. If not, then I do want to say again, thank you so much for being part of this meeting. Great council meeting. Thanks for all the membership. If you want to be part of any of the committees, the Adults, Children, Youth Committee or Legislative Committee, be sure and reach out to myself or Sam or, or Kayla, and we'll be sure to make sure that you get an opportunity to be part of these subcommittees. And if you know someone that's not on the on the uh, email list for the regional council, let us know. If you need a membership application, be sure and let to myself, Sam, or Kayla know, and we'll get that application to them. So our next scheduled meeting is for scheduled to be Tuesday, February the 8th, 2022, at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. And right now it's, it's scheduled at Frontier Health, but we will keep a post on the pandemic and the numbers and variances and we'll make a decision later whether or not that will be in person or virtual. At this time, then, I want to entertain a motion to adjourn. Do I hear one? This is Melissa Bardwell. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Melissa. Motion has been made. Do I hear a second? This is Kayla Wither. I second. Thank you, Kayla. Motion is made and seconded that we adjourn. And this meeting will stand adjourned. Thank you all again. Appreciate you. Have a great rest of your week and great holidays. Happy Thanksgiving and Christmas to everyone. Don't get to see you before the beginning of the new year. So happy holidays. Have a great rest of the year. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye